Loving God and Father, we give you thanks for your word. Thank you that you speak to us in ways that we can understand. Lord, help us to understand. Help us to take what you've taught us this morning and put it into work in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you'd like to follow along, we're looking this morning at Psalm 36. If you brought your Bibles, if you didn't bring yours, there's a pew Bible nearby, under you, or next to you, or near you, um, and you will find the text on page 465. This is a Psalm of David. Uh, it is a Psalm that uh, doesn't tell us when or where in his life circumstances that this was written, what undergirded it. But one of the questions that lies behind it is one of the perennial questions that we get asked all the time as believers. The first one is always God and suffering, but this is the second one. Why do the wicked prosper? Um, David is being harassed and he's being picked on by the wicked and they seem to be prospering and he seems to be struggling and so we don't know the specifics in the life of David that, that underlay this but we do know that this is part of the question that David is answering in the psalm. It's a comparison psalm like Psalm 1. I love Psalm 1. It is the righteous compared to the wicked or it's Jesus and then there's the rest of us. I love of Psalm 1. Psalm 2, it is the kings of the earth versus the king of the cosmos. And this one again is a comparison psalm. I like Graham Scroggie, the commentator, and he outlined it this way. Verses 1 through 4 are the sinner. Verses 5 through 9 are the Savior, and then verses 10 through 12 is the prayer of the saint. And so we've got uh, the, the passage outlined for us, and we will now begin to unpack it a little bit. Um, I love... I have come to love this psalm. It has moved up way in, in my esteem and, and way into the top of 150 psalms. This one's near the top for me of, of the psalms. I, I love this psalm. Um, this is a true story. In 1987, I was preparing a series of talks for a Young Life weekend. And leading up to that weekend, in the newspaper that week, there was a story. And so I thought, what a great illustration. A little boy's name is Rocco Morabito. And Rocco lived in Port Chester, New York, north of New York City, a kind of a tony suburb of New York City. Dad, it's middle of the week. Dad had gone off to work. Mom had a sick headache, and Mom was sick in bed. And so Rocco and his little sister were left to fend for themselves. So they discussed what they were going to do for breakfast and decided on donuts. But there's no donuts in the house. So Rocco climbs up on the cabinets. And then he reaches up on top of the refrigerator and pulls down mom's purse with her car keys and her wallet. And he takes his little sister by the hand and walks her out to the garage, straps her into her car seat because we've got to be safe. And then he opened the garage door and then he backed his mother's big station wagon, her land yacht huge station wagon. And in Port Chester, here's the house, here's their garage, here's the neighbor's house, here's their garage. So Rocco backs this land yacht between the two houses out to the street, and then he proceeds on his way to the donut shop. It's rush hour in a suburb of New York City, and he's driving down the main thoroughfare of Port Chester in New York, and he passes a state trooper, and the state trooper does a double take. I didn't see anybody driving that car. He was asked after the event, when he was interviewed by the newspaper, he said, I thought it was the invisible man driving. I didn't see anybody driving that car. So he comes out of the side street and he lights up Rocco, who puts on his blinker, and he pulls right over to the curb where he belongs, and the policeman gets out, and what are you doing? I'm getting donuts, and uh, where's your mother? She's homesick in bed. And they talk for a while, and then the policeman says, well, you know, your mother's going to have to come and get you. And Rocco says, but I've got the only car. But that's okay. I can drive. I'll go get her. <laughs> now, we've had a good laugh. We've had a giggle. It had a happy ending. Nobody got hurt. But do any of you think it's a good idea to put five-year-olds behind the wheel of a car? Tons of American steel driving down the road at speed. And <clears throat> he, he can barely... So he's perched on the pedals with his tiny little butt on the edge of the seat, looking through the steering wheel, barely clearing the dashboard enough to see where he's going. You know, this stuff's not funny, really, if you think about it. And so um, that's Rocco. If you look at the text, 
This also is Rocco. Um, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. Literally in the Hebrew, it is an oracle of the transgression speaks deeply into the heart. In other words, an oracle is one that gives forth revelation from God or one who is a prophet. And so the oracle of transgression, this, this person's God is transgression, it's sin. And this oracle speaks deep into the heart of the human being and we're fallen. This is a description of the natural man. This is the description of human beings. I've been told lately by some people that I should soft pedal sin and that I shouldn't press so hard on the button of sin and call people out and point at them and say, you're a sinner and you're a sinner and you're a sinner and you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. And I shouldn't do that because people find that offensive. Well, here's the text. And it is the oracle of transgression that calls to our hearts. It is hard to overcome this idea that we are good. The BTK killer. I, I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, but I couldn't believe it in the newspaper. He killed a dozen people in the Midwest, and he was recently interviewed for the paper, and he said, well, I still consider myself a good person. He's a mass murderer, but he's a good person. He's a good person. And we believe that in the depths of our being. See, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There's no fear of God before his eyes. And that word isn't awe and reverence. That word is dread. There's no dread of Judgment Day. There's no dread of accountability. There's no dread or fear that eventually that there will be a reckoning and that your chickens will come home to roost. This is it, that I'm going to go on and follow the desires of my heart, everyone else around me be damned. He flatters himself in his own eyes, Rocco. I've got the only car, but I can drive. I'll go get her. And we flatter ourselves, and we justify our sin, and we rationalize our sin, and it ceases to be sin anymore. We're convinced that we're good people and that the things that we're doing are good things. His iniquity, he believes, cannot be found out. The words of his mouth are deceit. He has ceased to act wisely. There's Rocco. He ceased to act wisely. I mean, there are laws against little children driving automobiles, but he doesn't care. He wants donuts, and so down the road he goes to get his donuts. And he's not alone. You know the name, George Armstrong uh, Custer. Um, <clears throat> years ago, when the kids were little, we took them on a trip west, and we got to the Battle of Little Bighorn. And so it was like 95 degrees. Guys, come on. There's going to be a reenactment, and it's going to be narrated by a park ranger. Well, they wouldn't get out of the air-conditioned car to go see this. They were reading their books, which was paybacks, because my dad took us to Bryce and Zion in Utah, and my dad would say, look at the rocks, look at the rocks. I wasn't looking at any rocks. I was reading my book. I can see pictures of rocks. I don't. So it was paybacks. So anyway, I got out and I listened to the narration and the, watched the reenactment, and it was really pretty amazing. And George Armstrong Custer, and I mean, when I say his name, you've got an image of him. He's in his skin tight, tailored uniforms, dashing and dapper, and he's got his flowing mane of blonde hair, and he is just preening, and he is full of pride. C.S. Lewis said that pride is the great sin. It was pride that made the devil the devil. And Custer decided on that morning at Little Bighorn that he was not going to obey his orders. He was going to arrange circumstances in such a way that when the battle was over and he of course assumed that he would win and he has won, he will get all the praise and all the glory and all the honor and that, that would be a springboard for him in his pride to become the President of the United States. So he disregarded his orders. If he had followed his orders that day, he would have been joined by General George Crook and his 2,000 men. He would have survived the day, won the battle, and he might have gone on to become president. Who knows? But the 7th Cavalry was slaughtered, and he was killed on that day. Pride. He deceived himself. He told himself lies. He didn't matter how many of the Indians, the Sioux there were, we're going to win this battle, and it's going to launch me on my political career. And so this is the natural man. This is the human heart. This is who we are without reference to God. Now the beauty is that the psalmist, David, now gives us reference to God. And he tells us who God is, and he gives us four attributes, four characteristics of who God is in his being. 
What God does comes out of who God is. It is his ontological being that produces the world and the creation and everything that goes on. And so the psalmist will describe four of these attributes or characteristics of God. Verse 5, your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. In other words, your, your love is infinite. There's no limitation to it. The universe continues to expand. You send up a rocket ship, it'll never get to the end of the universe because the universe continues to expand, at least according to physicists. I'm not one. I have to take their word for it. <laughs> loving kindness, and you know the word, chesed, steadfast love, loving kindness, covenant-keeping faithfulness. Um, Preacher Alexander McLaren preached a sermon on this, and he gave a, a page to each one of these attributes. Um, and he did it as uh, God's grace, God's compassion, God's uh, goodness, and his covenant-keeping faithfulness. And back in the day when you could preach for an hour, um, that's, that's what he did. Um, but we don't preach for an hour, so I just give you his little outline. Uh, and then there's the next one, again, verse 5, your faithfulness extends to the clouds. Not that God's faithfulness is in the clouds, but that it extends again up into the heavens. And the faithfulness here, according to McLaren again, is God's verbal revelation. The oracle of transgression speaks to the human heart, but God also speaks to human beings, and God makes covenants with them and promises to them. So in the garden, he promised you can have anything and do anything that you want to have, but don't eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. The day that you do it is the day that you will die. And so th they had complete freedom to do whatever they wanted, and they messed up. And then God made a covenant with Noah about the rainbow, and God made a covenant with Abraham, and a covenant with David, and Jesus comes and says, a new covenant I make with you. All of these predicated on numerous promises given by God to people, verbal. And so it's a verbal, or it's a word orientation or revelation. And it goes against the oracle that speaks to our hearts. And so it's hard for us to hear because of our fallenness, our brokenness, but God speaks truth to us. And this is the good news. This is the gospel. We're sinners. How's that good news? Because if you don't understand that, then you don't understand the blessings of God and the good news when you hear it. Why Jesus? Why, why send Jesus if we're like the BTK killer and we're convinced of our utter and innate goodness? We're good people. I never killed anybody. I'm a good person. No, you aren't. Neither am I. And so this is a comparison between the natural man and God. And so we see first his loving kindness that extends to the heavens and then his faithfulness that he makes promises. And in the scriptures, over millennia, he keeps his promises to the finest details. Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. Jesus, I mean, things that Jesus couldn't control. There are 300, just 300 messianic prophecies about Jesus by himself, in addition to all the other promises of the scriptures. And then your righteousness is like the mountains of God, and your judgments are like the great deep. Your righteousness. Now, we don't really understand righteousness since the Reformation. I think that uh, N.T. Wright is helping us again to understand what that word means. We hear righteousness and we think law-keeping, being good, um, and that's what it means to most people. But that's, according to N.T. Wright, that's not really what it is. It's about a relationship. It's a relationship word. It's not a forensic and legal word. It's relationship. That God, on his part, in relationship to human beings, always keeps his side of the street clean. He will always do the right thing. God can be counted on in relationship. Men are faithless. Men are unfaithful. Men turn on God and turn away from God. Again, that's the natural inclination of the human heart. But this is who God is. He is faithful always and will always do the right thing. And then the ESV says, and his judgments. Or in the Hebrew, tzedakah, it is justice. And so he has because of who he is, built into his creation, rightness and goodness. Um, and the laws of the universe reflect who this God is in his being. So we've compared the human being to God. Now, the, the, the psalmist continues here at the end of that verse that this isn't just about 
human beings or just about the world. He says, Man and beast you save, O Lord. That there, there are cosmic implications to our sin and rebellion, and there are cosmic implications for God's plan of redemption and to bring us home. And in a few minutes, we will celebrate that plan coming to the Lord's table to take communion, that God so loved the world that he gave his son. And the world includes not just people, but the animals, the, the world itself, that God is busy reconciling all things, bringing all things into right relationship with himself. Now, if as a human being you hear God's diagnosis of your problem and you see God for who he really is, Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6 he was worshiping in the temple and he actually had a vision. He realized in reality who God is, high and lifted up, his train filling the temple. And he said, woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. When you see God for who God really is, then you can easily recognize that you aren't him, that you don't reflect him as well as you should, that you aren't the kind of person that you were created to be. And when that comes to you and you realize that, you repent. You're headed down the road as a natural human being and you realize, oh my gosh, God. And then you turn around and you go back in a different direction. You repent. And for the repentant, David gives us four blessings that he sees for those who have repented, for those who, um, now again, this is wisdom literature, so there's code words, there's language here. Um, in Proverbs, in the Psalms, in Ecclesiastes, the wicked, unrighteous, godless are people without reference to God, and the godly, the righteous, and the wise are those who get it. So here are the blessings to those who are wise, to those who are godly. They feast on the abundance of your house. Go back up to the top of seven. How precious is your steadfast love. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Now, he doesn't use the word satisfaction here, but that's what he's talking about. The satisfaction that we experience in relationship to God and in right relationship to one another and the creation in which we live. And so... They feast on the abundance of your house. Commentators are split about what's the house. The temple, but there's no other reference to temple worship, to temple laws and rules. It's not the temple, probably. Or maybe it's heaven where God dwells. So Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. But it's not that either because he's talking about man and beast and he's talking about this world that we live in. That God's house is this world that we live in. That the sun comes up and it shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. It rains on the just and the unjust. It's called common grace. And that God pours forth his blessings that we take for granted, minute by minute, day by day. Without reference to God, we don't know where all of these things come from. And we don't acknowledge the goodness of the creator who gave them to us. Paul writes in Romans 1, that the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and godlessness of men. The first four verses here. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks. Again, the human being who doesn't believe in a judgment day, who lives their life without reference to God. We all know people like that. They're not horrible, necessarily horrible people. They're not the BTK killer. But this is a description of the natural man in their habitat and in their life. But for the Christian, for the follower, for the wise person, there is a recognition of God's blessings in this world that he has given us. And then in the next verse, um, they feast on the abundance of your house and you give them to drink from the river of your delights. Delights there is, you know this word, Eden, and it's in the plural. He takes the reader back to the Garden of Eden prior to sin. Genesis 1 and 2, where there is goodness and provision and wonder at every turn. They wake up in the morning and they try fruit from a different tree and it's got a different taste than the one that they ate yesterday. Um, great theologian and songwriter, godfather of Christian rock and roll, Larry Norman, has a line in one of his songs that each day is different and life is a thrill 
And they knew tomorrow would be even better still. That was life in Eden. And this is in the plural, Edens. It's piled one on top of the other. Delights and joy and provision and goodness and all kinds of experiences. And we turned it all over to Satan in chapter 3, and we became like verses 1 through 4. But when we repent and when we return to God, we recognize this is the world that he's given us. This is the home where God dwells, and that God continues to give us blessings if we'll only open our eyes and recognize them. And then two more blessings that he gives, and they're bound together. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. Life and light together. Back at the beginning of John's Gospel, the first 18 verses are called the prologue. And almost all the commentators say that part of the prologue came from Psalm 36, what we just read. When he says life, he's talking about physical life. That our physical life is a gift given to us by God. Verse 4 in John chapter 1. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That our life comes to us from God. It's a gift given to us by God. And it's physical life. Verse 3 says, um, All things were made through him, and without him not anything was made. It's physical life, but it's also spiritual life. Down in verses 12 and 13, if we believe in Jesus, then we are adopted as children of God, born not of the flesh, not of the will of man, but born of the Spirit. So it's physical life, it is spiritual life that he's talking about. And then it is revealed to us by light. Jesus is the light of the world. He said to his disciples, go and you be the light of the world. And we shine forth these truths that we are called to live out in relationship to God. Back to Psalm 36. And so we've got the comparison. We have the natural man. We have God in his character, in his being. We have the blessings that he pours out on us if we will simply open our eyes and acknowledge who he is and what he gives us. And then he prays. Remember that this is answering the question, why do the wicked uh, prosper? And so here's his prayer. He's being harassed by the wicked. And he prays this. Verse 10, O continue your steadfast love to those who know you. The Christian faith, Judaism as well, is not religion. Religion is a bunch of works. Do good works, do good works, God. Look at me, look at me, look at how swell I am. That's religion. No, the faith is a relationship with your Creator, to those who know God, who walk in relationship with Him. It's not about good deeds and good works and the law and the keeping of all the rules. It's about being in relationship with the God who created you. God, continue in your steadfast love to those who love you and your righteous to the upright of heart. Again, righteousness has to, a relational word, and it has to do with being in right relationship with God. And then here's the prayer. Let not the foot of arrogance, or let not the foot of pride, stand on my neck. These arrogant, these prideful, sinful people are harassing me, and I am about to go under. Don't let them put their foot on my neck, nor the hand of the wicked. Do not let them drive me away. And then here is what he has concluded. There the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down. They are unable to rise. Based on the character and quality of God, he knows that God will not ultimately, maybe in the short run, but God will not ultimately let the wicked prosper. And that a time is coming, though they have no fear, no dread of judgment. A time of accountability, a time of judgment is coming, and they will stand before that God, and they will be laid low. And that David trusts in God's ultimate righteousness and in his ultimate justice. That regardless of current circumstances, he knows who God is. And he knows ultimately how things are going to end up. This is, again, it's the good news of the gospel. Jesus is, in the Hebrew or Aramaic, Yeshua. Literally, it is Yahweh saves. This is a poem of praise to Jesus. Jesus is the one who is righteous. Jesus is the one who is faithful. Jesus is the one who is just. It's a description of our Savior. So the question that lies before us is, 
Will we see ourselves the way that God sees us? Will we acknowledge his diagnosis of our problem? Will we own our sin and brokenness? Or will we pretend like the BTK killer that I'm still a good person? No, you aren't. But you serve a good God. You serve a gentle and loving God whose loving kindness extends to the heavens. Will you repent? Will you be wise? Will you be upright and will you turn in the direction of God and walk in right relationship with Him? That's the question that David wants you to answer this morning. Amen.